Gary. Welcome, everybody. Um, it is approximately 1 o'clock, uh, right at the top of the hour. Um, I'm on the East Coast. I'm in Florida, so we are currently experiencing a little bit of weather here. Um, that uh, just wanted to uh, alert you to that, just in case we lose connection or um, my voice goes in and out. But hopefully that won't affect us today. Uh, we're here for about the next uh, next hour, a little bit less than that. Maybe we're just going to go over the RAT5 overview, and we're going to talk about its applications. So hopefully you'll all be able to sit back and relax, and uh, please feel free to put any questions you have in the chat box. I can address those as I see them come up. So this is our agenda for today. Uh, we are going to go over background uh, of the test. We're going to talk about an overview of it, what it is, and um, what exactly we're measuring with the RAT5. Uh, we will talk about the test structure, and also really the, the end of this is going to be talking about applications, and specifically how we can use the RAT5 to answer uh, questions, clinical questions, um, academic questions coming into us that we may, uh, may need to uh, address. So if we go back in terms of what we, what we know for the RAT5, its history, its background, uh, the authors are Gary Wilkinson and Gary Robertson. And the history, but the history goes, goes way back. The history goes way back to the 40s um, with a norm update in 1978. And I believe the current authors um, came on board with the RAT in the 80s. So we have the RAT R coming out in 84, the RAT 3 coming out in 93, the RAT 4 coming out in 2006, and now the fifth edition coming out in 2017. <clears throat> so what I want to really just show you uh, and kind of get the point across with this type of slide is that this is a test that has a long history. Um, it's been used quite frequently. It's used um, pretty widely in our profession and in our field, um, and, and it goes back very far. So it's a, it's a long trusted academic achievement measure a little bit to think about what it is. Um, I think that's really one of the most important questions to start with. Um, why are we pulling this out of our toolkit? Um, why do we need to have it as part of our toolkit? And what, what are we specifically going to be looking at with it? Well, it is efficient. Uh, it's, it's short, and I'm going to show you that as we go along. It's easy to administer. Um, you know, that's one of the, that's one of the key pieces that uh, myself as a psychologist and other of my colleagues talk about frequently, which is the ease of administration for the RAT5. That's one of the keys uh, for, for why a lot, of, uh, a lot of professionals like to use it. But it's also psychometrically sound. Um, and if you think about the history of, uh, of the test going back to the 40s, you have a test that's been researched uh, and, 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 and revised and, and um, updated uh, with, with a long, long history of, of our understanding of how to measure certain skills. So when you have that history, um, the, the psychometrics of it just get better over time, uh, and that's really a benefit to it. And we're really looking here at foundational academic skills. So I want to differentiate that for you from what would be considered more of a, a, a comprehensive measure. You know, comprehensive measures, and I'll just name a few, like the, uh, the Wexler uh, Achievement Test, the, the Kaufman Achievement Test, um, the, the uh, Woodcock-Johnson Achievement Test. Th those types of assessments, while we're measuring, um, uh, are also measuring academics, those are more comprehensive because we're looking at skills um, from, multiple, from multiple data points um, rather than just a single data point. What the RAT5 is giving us is, uh, is an estimation of overall skill um, based on four data points in word reading, sentence comprehension, spelling, and math computation. If we think about what is the purpose of this tool, I think that's really sort of the most important point, right? Uh, you know, we put a lot of effort into revising tests and making sure that they meet the standard rigor of our professions, but really pulling it out is, is what I always come back to as being one of the more important things to consider when you're pulling out a test. But it does support the evaluation process for estimating strengths and weaknesses. Um, and, and I wanted to say estimating there because if we're looking at strengths and weaknesses, we tend to, as best practice indicates, look for multiple data points. And what the, uh, what the, um, the RAT5 does give us is, is a single data point for each of these areas. So I want to say estimating there, although it can lead us to more comprehensive assessment over time, I want you to, to step back and just make sure you know that we are looking at a screening type of a measure for a specific data point. And when we look at these strengths and weaknesses or we estimate a person's academic skills, it does indicate to us how well a person learns. Uh, it can be used for job readiness. And, you know, that, that second bullet point, job readiness, there's lots of research out there that talks about the use of these four types of academic measures to indicate whether or not somebody's ready for uh, a job or, or job placement. 
transition from special education services at 21 into the adult workforce, for example. So there are a lot, there's a lot of research out there that talks about using this type of data for that. And also the functional academic skills piece. And, and what, what that means, I maybe, maybe I can get into that a little bit more, provide a little more data later on, or a little more information later on about that. But if we're looking at older adults, looking at uh, trying to figure out um, level of care and so forth, functional skills are really important for us to, uh, for us to evaluate. It does go beyond the school setting. It's super important for us to remember that even though this is an academic achievement test, yes, it can be used in schools, but there are many, many uses beyond the school setting, and I'll get into that a little, little bit more in detail as we talk about applications. And again, that last point is that we consider the RAT5, and the RAT5 is, is widely considered as a screener and not comprehensive, and I kind of gave you some information about why that's the case already. In terms of an overview for the test, it is qualification level B. And um, if you need additional information about what that qualification level means, uh, please feel free to go to uh, the Pearson Clinical website. It's uh, www.pearsonclinical.com or .ca if you're in Canada. And it'll give you some information about what that means. Uh, the age range for this test is, is broad. We're looking at a wide age range here, looking from five years of age all the way through 85 plus. So what that allows us to do is allows us to use one single measure across a large uh, or a wide varied range of, of, uh, of clients. If you're in schools and you're trying to think about where we would apply this at the response to intervention tier level, um, we feel that the RAT5 is most applicable at the tier two or tier three level. So it does give us some specific data about learning um, that goes beyond observational um, and uh, classroom type of data. So we would consider this at the tier two or tier three level. When I, when I referenced before um, the short completion time, I, I really was not kidding about that. Um, when we're looking at four subtests, even though they're just four subtests, um, we are looking from 15 to 25 minutes for, for ages five through seven, and then about 35, possibly up to 45 minutes, although that's probably a top, age, a top uh, uh, range for completion for ages eight years and up. And we can expect, uh, we would expect that, right? So if we're looking at older children and adults, we would expect them to go further on a test like this than we would the younger kids. We do have several administration and scoring options with the RAT5, and that's part of what the revision included. So not only do we have the paper, the traditional paper and pencil test that we're all familiar with, um, we also have the upcoming release of the Q Interactive version. So Q Interactive is, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Q Interactive, it is a, uh, a tablet-based, uh, iPad-based, administration and scoring uh, platform. Um, and feel free to go to the website www.helloq.com and it'll get you some additional information about what Q Interactive is. So essentially what we did with this administrator with this uh, revision is, is not only update uh, the paper and pencil version but also develop the, the digital version. And that's not out yet but it is coming soon. So along with the administration options, there are two different um, scoring options. The first scoring option is, again, hand scoring. Um, you're able to do that traditionally as you have in the past. Or you can use Q Global. Uh, so Q Global is an online scoring and reporting system that you put in the raw scores. Uh, it it, it uh, tracks your clients um, or your students' data, um, um, your, your demographic data, and then you put in the raw scores and it gives you the standard scores. But also Q Interactive. So the difference with this one is Q Interactive is automatic scoring. <clears throat> so when you are giving a paper and pencil version, you would either have to hand score or put the raw scores into a scoring program. Q Interactive does that for you, so you don't actually have to put the, uh, the, the, tests, the test scores anywhere else. It will automatically convert those. It's important for us to remember what scores are available. So when we choose tests, part of the choice process is to determine what data we're getting from it. And the score data is super important. Uh, for what we need it to, to use it for what we need it for. So with standard scores, we're able to compare a person's per, uh, performance to a standard score or a standard population. So if we're looking at an older adult and we want to say, um, how did um, Mr. Uh, Mr. John Doe, how did he do compared to other 60-year-olds? Um, we can actually say, uh, let's take this, this uh, client's raw scores and compare those to other 60-year-olds to determine where his academic skills actually do lie. 
So that's what we're looking at with standard scores. And that application is, is very important for certain reasons. For other reasons, you might not need that level of data. So it's important to remember why you have that there. We're also able to look at the percentile ranks, um, stay nines, NCEs, grade equivalents, and also growth scale values. I'll get into that a little bit more later on as we talk about this, um, uh, talk about the uses of this. But the growth scale values, for those of you who are unfamiliar, they're a, I'm going to say a newer, a newer score. Uh, they've been around for a little bit of time, but um, they're, they're, they're newer in a lot of the tests that are coming out now. And essentially what that does, um, the growth scale value is a representation of a person's performance uh, across time. So what we're able to do with that, it's, it's, a, it's a transformation of the raw score. So it's not, um, it's not uh, depend, uh, dependent on a standard uh, population's performance. It's, it's dependent on a person's performance across time. So what I'm able to do is I'm able to look at time one and time two to determine whether or not a person's made progress whether or not they've um, they've uh, they've gone uh, they've lost some progress or whether or not they've lost skill uh, a lot of times after uh, a head injury or a major medical condition we want to determine whether or not some skill was lost so there are many applications of that and i think uh, what what you will hopefully be able to see is that the growth scale values significantly increase the interpretive potential of a test like the rat 5 So let me get into what the RAT5 has that is different from the RAT4. I think that's a really important component too. And one of the questions I'll ask later on is, why update from the 4 to the 5? So the first point here I'll talk about are, are new norms. So if we go back to 2006, we're looking at an o over a decade uh, long, um, uh, decade old standardization sample. So what we want to be able to do um, in any case is best practice to look at updated norms to reflect our current population. Number two is we do have improved identification of learning disabilities. So the AAD analysis um, can be done and that can be found in the manual. The PSW analysis, the uh, pattern of strengths and weaknesses analysis <clears throat> is also new um, and that's available with the digital scoring option. And there are additional validity studies that targeted LD reading and LD math. Now what that does, the three of those in combination with each other uh, increase your interpretive potential for looking at whether a pattern uh, for a person's uh, ability to, to learn or what their actual skill levels are. Um, so those three things in, in combination with each other can be used to really help you identify uh, whether or not somebody has a learning disability. Number three here is the streamlining of rules. Um, so there are grade-based start points. The reversal rules are easy uh, and they're easy to follow and the discontinual rules are very clear. That allows you to really focus on what you need to administer. So uh, when you're looking at, for those of you who are familiar with the four, when you're looking at the five, you'll see an ease of administration that was made um, based on that, that, that clarity um, and the simpl simplification of the rules. We also have number four there, which I talked about a little bit already, which is the digital administration scoring and reporting. That's new for the five. Um, the, uh, the addition of the Q Global scoring. So really the point of me putting it on a separate slide is to really just highlight the speed and efficiency um, uh, that you have with something like a, a, an online scoring and reporting system. It does allow you to organize a lot easier. The generation of scores and reports are much more streamlined when you're using an online scoring and reporting system. I know a lot of us like to do the hand scoring, um, or a lot of us are just in that practice, um, but moving to a digital assessment or a digital scoring platform really does allow you to focus your services in a much better way. It allows us to use our professional judgment in a way um, that we were trained to do and rather than focus on, on scoring. The Q Global or the Q Interactive Administration scoring goes one step further, which is uh, removing a lot of the paper and pencil uh, necessity of the, the standard assessment process we're used to and really moving into a system where um, the, the scoring, the reporting, the, the administration rules, the, the, um, the start points, the discontinual rules, all that, are, are, easy, are, are made easier, um, the scaffolding is built in, so the actual administration of those items in that test become much more simplified. And number seven is really the main difference, the subtest improvements. So I have four bullet points here. Uh, math computation subtest does have a wider range of domains now. Uh, we are looking at additional domains being assessed with, uh, with, uh, with math computation. The sentence comprehension has new subtest items. Uh, again, the shortened and simplified context uh, sentence prompts for spelling. And they added lowercase letters 
and allowed letter sounds as correct responses on letter reading. If we look at the standardization information, um, it was standardized on a national grade and age-based sample, so each had over 2,000 individuals. So you're looking at a very large standardization sample, and the scores were developed for grades K through 12 and for ages 8 through 85 plus. The reliability and validity information is, is, uh, is what I have here is what we currently have available. Um, all of the updated information will be available in the manual once the test is released. But what I have for you to talk about right now is the internal reliability coefficients, which indicate very good to excellent um, coefficients. So we're looking at the reflection of error in a test, and we know that every test has error. Um, so we're, we're never going to find a 1.0 um, uh, reliability coefficient. It's a reflection of error. So the error then indicates to us how well we can use a test uh, to predict certain skills or predict certain performance, and that would then indicate validity. So the, the validity um, information is that we have from the RAT5. It was determined from the content and structure of the test battery, and also um, a pretty significant amount of special group studies um, to look at um, how those patterns uh, applied to certain samples and how they also um, uh, would indicate or could be used when, when uh, interpreting information or interpreting performance of other achievement and cognitive ability measures. So are we looking at the same types of skills um, and how do those skills perform in special groups? So the clinical samples that were done in the study were gifted, um, intellectual disability, learning disability in reading, and learning disability in math. We do have correlations available um, for the achievement tests uh, for the RAT4 and the Wyatt 3 and also the current correlation ability test with the ability tests of WISC-5 and with WASI 2 although that's going to expand uh, when, new, uh, when new cognitive ability tests are uh, released in uh, 2018. So let's look at the test structure. Uh, let's think about what we're actually measuring. So again, we are looking at derived scores and interpretive information for these four subtests. We have word reading, sentence comprehension, spelling, and math computation. And each of those subtests will provide its own set of scores. Uh, we also do have a composite score, so I'll go over that in a little bit, a little bit more detail uh, in a little bit, but we have the reading composite score available. With word reading, we are looking at an untimed letter ID and word recognition test. Um, in this test, the examinee would read aloud a list of letters and words. For sentence comprehension, we're looking at uh, measuring a, a person's ability to identify the meanings of words and to comprehend the ideas and information in a sentence using an untimed modified, modified closed procedure. So each item will require the examinee to read. They could read it either aloud or silently. They'll have to read a sentence with a word or two missing, uh, and then they'll be able to provide a response to effectively complete the sentence. For spelling, we'll look at uh, an individual's ability to write letters and words from dictation, and there's no time limit for this test either. Math computation is looking at an individual's ability to count, identify numbers, solve simple oral math problems, and then calculate written math problems with a time limit. So these problems are going to be presented to the examinees in a range of domains, and that includes arithmetic, algebra, geometry, and also some advanced operations. And then going back to that reading composite score, uh, the reading composite will be a combination of word reading and sentence comprehension. So with this reading composite, uh, this if we differentiate between single and multiple data points, uh, the reading composite is made up of multiple data points, as, as any composite would be unless it's an estimation. But the reading composite score can be used to give an estimate of not only a person's ability to read words, but then also comprehend what they're reading. Um, so you can apply it a little bit more, a little more comprehensively for that purpose. Okay, let me take a quick break before I move on to applications and just look through some of the questions and see if any questions that I can have come up. A bunch have come through. Um, I apologize. Let me see if there's any that I can uh, answer as we're going along. <clears throat> I did have a question that said um, what RTI stands for. So um, RTI in the educational sphere stands for Response to Intervention. Um, I had a question that came um, through with somebody uh, from somebody in the UK. What does Tier 2 and 3 equate to in England? I am not sure. Um, I, I'm not as familiar with the uh, with the UK um, equivalents of tiers. Um, however, uh, feel free to uh, to go to the customer support website um, for Pearson UK, 
um, and they should be able to answer that question for you. Um, so another question, do you download papers for testing by pen, pencil and paper, or do you still need to order them? Yes, you do need to order the forms. Um, I did have a question that came through asking if test protocols are needed with Q-Interactive administration. Um, not the protocols, but there are certain uh, response books that you do need to have with Q-Interactive administration. So for those of you uh, who are unfamiliar with Q-Interactive, most of the time Q-Interactive administration get rid of all paper and pencil, but for this test, um, not all of them do that. Um, some of the applications do still need response books, and the RAT5 does need some response books. Okay, um, so let me see. Let me see here. Okay, let me move on to applications, and then I'll see some of the additional questions as we move along. So in terms of applications, let's first start by, I wanted to ask you all a question, um, just to get a sense of who we're talking to in the room here today. We have a large number of folks um, participating. Um, but your professional role, do you mind uh, indicating to me what your professional role is? Excuse me. All right, so we have a large number of school, clinical, and neuropsychologists, um, a large number of special educators and other, um, some speech pathologists in the room. No OTs. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for that. In terms of what we're using this for, what, uh, again, I want you to kind of start back by saying this is a screening test. However, don't limit yourself by saying it's a screening test because it's a, it's a screening test for certain skills that can be used to inform more comprehensive evaluation or can be used to inform more comprehensive levels of, of understanding a person's skill levels. So what we're using for screening, essentially, we can think about a number of different questions. Uh, and I think this is where we pull ourselves back when we are, uh, when we're trying to pull out a test from our toolkit to say, what can we actually use this for? And I want you to, I want you to really understand that these 11 points up here are not comprehensive. These are the, these are the questions that I put up here um, just to kind of spark your thinking about why you'd pull this test out. The first one is to identify people at risk for learning disabilities. Again, because it's not comprehensive, I want you to be uh, cautious to use only the, the RAT5 as a measure of determining learning disability. But over time, even for older adults, um, using this data can help you drive that information. Again, determining academic skills in reading, writing, and math, that's pretty straightforward. Educational placement, we can be using this information to contribute to a neuropsychological or a psychoeducational evaluation. There are many types of evaluation um, again, as you heard Sherry talk about in the, the beginning of this presentation, my background is in school psychology. And a lot of times when I'm pulling out uh, an evaluation for, uh, for a student, um, either in special or general education, many times I don't need a comprehensive level of academic achievement. Uh, a lot of times I can get that data from other sources. Um, so, so the RAT5 can be used in those situations as well. Um, determination of a d disability, a lot of times learning disabilities or other disabilities, assistance for determining skill set, so looking at acquired skills versus emerging skills. Determining premorbid functioning. We'll get into that in a little bit more, a little more detail later on. But what we definitely know is that the tests involved, many of the tests involved um, in a RAT5 administration can be good indication of premorbid functioning, specifically reading. Um, so we'll look at that in a little bit more detail later on. But in the application uh, for older adults or post-injury uh, TBI patients, or stroke or what have you, a premorbid functioning uh, can be assessed using the RAC5 or can be, uh, some data can be gathered using the RAC5. Again, growth uh, or change over time, again, that's a reference back to the GSV, the growth scale value scores that I talked about earlier. Vocational training or job placement to determine uh, whether or not somebody would be successful in one of those settings, uh, absolutely an application. Um, and then level of care and home support services. I'll get into that a little bit more later on. Um, I do have some speech language pathologists in the group today. Uh, some OTs um, hopefully also are, are, are also part of this and psychologists. Um, but for older adults, the, the data that we gather to determine what level of care an older adult needs, what type of support services they may need in the home, really thinking about that continuum of care, 
Uh, that's a super important question that we have to answer, and getting additional data points can be, can be beneficial. If we look at the historical viewpoint, so why have people chosen to use the RAT for so long? Some of the data going back to the RAT R is, is pretty, um, pretty uh, strong, really, for why a lot of uh, clinicians have used it for so long. The first point here is that it has very strong normative data. So the RAT R, going back to the RAT R, and even if you put, look at the, the norms uh, for the RAT 5, we're normed on 5,600 individuals um, for the RAT R. That's a, that's a very large um, normative sample. Uh, so it had really strong normative data. That was one of the main reasons why people chose it for so long. The second one is another one based on some information coming from Krauss and colleagues in 84, which was that the RAT R was really shown to be a very good estimate of premorbid verbal intelligence for lower functioning patients or clients. And we know that those lower functioning, uh, lower cognitively functioning um, clients are also at a higher risk for TBI. So it's important to remember or to go back. It really gives us a viewpoint or a step forward for why we choose the RAT5 today, um, why it's been used for so long. The RAT5 continues to step up from where it has been in the past. So if we look at this historical data, it really does help us uh, answer that information <clears throat> or answer those questions. In terms of its application in the neuropsych um, field or neuropsych world, uh, it's important for us to know what a hold test is. So what a hold test does is it taps abilities which are really thought to be pretty much resistant to cognitive de decline or less resistant to cognitive decline following neurological damage. So as a result, these tests are widely used for estimating premorbid intelligence in conditions such as dementia, uh, TBI, and stroke. So in terms of hold or don't hold methods, um, they estimate premorbid ability based on the individual's current performance on a test that's considered to be relatively resistant to neurological impairment. So the tests that we're including, or many of the tests that we have included here in the RAT5. So most of these approaches can be grouped into really two major types. Those based on patterns of performance on the Wechsler intelligence scale, and those based on word reading ability. Um, so when we think about word reading, specifically word reading on this, on this uh, assessment, we are looking at a test that can be used in, in, in hold analyses. Um, if we, well, let, me move, let me move forward real quick. Um, oh, I have it on the next slide, I apologize. I was gonna start talking about a point and then I remembered I had it on the next slide, I apologize for that. So if we think about the reading nuances, to, to kind of go a step further in terms of why reading is so important, think about a little bit of, of why the nuances, or what the nuances are for the RAT5 and the reading test. So the reading test for RAT5 includes both regularly and irregularly spelled words. Um, it is a test that's organized based on item difficulty, but many of the earlier or easy items are going to be, uh, are going to be sight words, and many of the later, more difficult items may be irregular words. So we have the ability to look at not only regular, but also irregularly spelled words. That's a real benefit. And also, there, there's a you know, study going into 1991 from Wilshire and colleagues that talked about why word reading tests were so important. Um, what they indicated is that reading is highly correlated with intelligence in the general population. It's also, again, they, they reiterated how uh, resistant it is to dementia, um, and it is more resistant than the weights vocabulary subtest, for those of you familiar with the Wexler adult uh, ability scale. Um, also, the reading of irregular words is more resistant to cognitive decline than the reading of regular words. So the RAT5 includes both. And word reading does tap previous knowledge while minimizing the demands on current cognitive capacity. So those are some, reading, some reasons why it's important to think about uh, pulling out a test like the RAT5 specifically when we're looking at these, these issues because of how the reading test is organized. We can use the RAT5 to contribute to a battery. So the RAT5 can serve as part of a comprehensive psychoed battery or part of a comprehensive neuropsych battery to really enhance our understanding of an individual's total functioning. Um, it can be a battery that's used in schools, in clinics, in hospitals, uh, in private practices, and also other, other settings to help us understand or really enhance our ability to understand a person's functioning. Um, academic, is part, academic achievement is part of a battery um, in many different, for many different reasons. Um, it can be used as part of the cognitive ability or the cognitive impairment analysis. Um, it should be used as part of a personality analysis uh, for speech and language development and or impairment um, evaluation, and also in the evaluation of fine and gross motor skills. 
And if you think about academic achievement, I oftentimes think about it as an outcome. Not, not the case in every situation, but as an outcome. So if we have, for example, if we have a fine and gross motor analysis, and say an uh, occupational therapist is doing a fine motor analysis, and determines that there's a fine motor weakness or a visual spatial um, processing weakness, and we can link that then to an academic achievement, an academic weakness as well, then we can really talk about the linkage between um, th those two deficits and, and how that occurs and why that possibly can occur. So it's important for us to go back and remember uh, why we are applying this test and what, at what point. Are we thinking about it as, as an outcome? Are we thinking about it as related to other weaknesses? Um, additionally, um, we can um, test large populations with the RAT5. So one of the things that I did not mention earlier, a word I did not use earlier, was that it's flexible. Um, it's brief, of course it's brief. We know that it's going to be short. Uh, we can use it when we have to administer uh, to a large number of people and when we have when comprehensive batteries are impractical right? if we have uh, we only have limited time so if we have to use a long battery that would be impractical in certain settings but also because math computation and spelling can be administered in small group test sessions so we can actually apply this test in small settings in small group settings if it really uh, makes sense for our population and it does, again, as I mentioned earlier, have, earlier, have a large application outside of school systems. Um, military recruits um, in the evaluation or assessment of academic skills in prisoners, um, we know that that's a huge uh, need for uh, psychologists in, um, in prison settings to determine uh, which prisoners need additional or have learning disabilities. We know that that population is high. Um, can be applied in, uh, to patients in a hospital. Uh, applications to industry training programs are also juvenile delinquents awaiting court hearings. So there are many applications outside of schools. I just wanted to highlight those. And there are several others as well. Uh, if you had any that you wanted to put in the chat box, feel free to do so. Um, but there are several others as well um, because if you think about an academic achievement test, a lot of times the first thing we think about is application in a school setting. But what I wanted to make sure I, I kind of got across at this point is that yes, it can be applied in the school setting, but yes, it can also be applied in other settings as well. <clears throat> so let's just do a quick review of the features and benefits. I want to make sure that I review these at the end so that you get a sense of why this test um, is a choice, or should be a choice, or can be also part of your toolkit. The first one is that the subtests uh, really focus on those key foundational academic skills. Um, and those are academic skills that we know have been studied quite extensively in, in, uh, in the literature um, and, and uh, kind of highlighted in the literature as needing them to succeed in a work or school setting. So um, that's one of the main areas. It's a foundational academic skill analysis. Number two is that it's time efficient. Again, um, as little as 15 minutes for the youngest of kids and then older children and adults, um, likely around 30, 35, 40 minutes to complete. <clears throat> the ease of administration and scoring uh, again, uh, you know, the administration rules are clearer, they're more simple, they're simplified, the scoring guidelines are easier, and it really does contribute to an accurate and timely data analysis for you. Um, the wide range of administration, it really allows you to assess a wide range of learners or a wide range of clients um, with the same assessment. In terms of progress monitoring, um, so the, there are parallel forms that make retesting easier. Um, the blue and green forms can be used interchangeably and they have comparable results uh, and that allows you a shorter resting time between assessments. Um, uh, so, so that's really important to remember there are two uh, parallel forms. And then also again going back to that growth scale value um, point later which is a very efficient way to track progress over time. Um, let me just stop real quick to talk about that in a little bit more detail which is that growth scale value. So if you think about what a growth scale value is, again, a measurement of a person's ability over time, so their ability to complete their skill. If you were to compare that to a, a standard score, what that allows you to do, to do is determine how far or how fast a person is making progress compared to their peer group and whether or not they're actually acquiring any additional skill. So let me give you an example of that. If somebody's growth scale value over time increases from time one to time two, and their standard score also increases from time one to time two. What that allows you to do is make, uh, uh, basically make an estimation or determination that this person is acquiring skills faster than their peer group. 
because they're increasing uh, their standard score increased from time one to time two, and their growth scale value also went up. So that's only that's not only a reflection of skill increase, but it's also a reflection of uh, their increase or their speed compared to their peer group. Now, contrary to that, if a person's growth scale value went up from time one to time two, that indicates that their skill increased. Now, let's say that their standard score went down or stayed the same. What that means then is that even though that this person uh, this person may be increasing their skill, let's say, in reading, um, they're not doing it as fast as their peer group would, or they're doing it at the same speed as their peer group. So that's really important. And then again, if we go back to medical conditions or injury, um, stroke, TBI, those types of things, if a person's skill, uh, um, growth skill value goes down from time one to time two, that means they lost some skill. So that's a lot of times the, the situations where those cases come up, and it's important for us to know what those mean. But I really wanted to highlight that here because the progress monitoring component can be very beneficial depending on your setting. In terms of the flexible administration, again, you can use it within, with individuals or small groups. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, you can only administer one subtest if you want, if that's all that you need is one subtest. Again, it's flexible because you can look at paper and pencil or digitally with Q-Interactive. And also you have the flexibility of scoring with Q-Global. So you have the ability to do it digitally or pay up by hand. And the last one is that it is, uh, it, it's a very reliable and valid test, and that strong reliability does allow us to have some confidence when we're interpreting results. So if we think about the value of using this test in clinical and educational settings, really these four points are why it's so valuable to us uh, in our profession, which is one, it's efficient. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time doing um, assessments that we may not need. Um, it's easy, it's psychometrically sound, and it's flexible. Those are four main points as, that would drive my decision or my value in having the RAT5 in my toolkit. It is a norm reference test of measuring word reading, sentence comprehension, spelling, and math computation. And, and we're going to be wrapping up here. We're not going to go an entire hour, but I wanted to really, again, at the end here, talk about its application in other spheres, um, application in speech and language and OT spheres. So. A lot of times what we need to think about is, uh, I know a lot of you on the call today are psychologists or educators. Uh, many times when we're thinking about using this test, uh, we, we think about it through our own lenses. But this test, a test like the RAT5 can also be applied um, by other professionals in, in areas that make sense to their practice. And speech and language and OTs um, can also give this test and should also give this test to get data to drive these types of questions that I have written on the screen. The first one, how much uh, or how does or how much does a disability affect, uh, affect a client's ability to do whatever? So if you want to think about um, a person's ability to read or a person's ability to do mathematics, how does that affect, or writing, how does that affect their ability to do any of their daily tasks? The next one, how do clients' academic skills, so if we think about it in reverse, how do their academic skills, reading, writing, and math, affect their ability to function independently? So if you have an older adult um, or an, an adult with a disability um, and they're going to be living independently or in a supported living environment, are they going to be able to pay their bills um, independently? Are they going to be able to write emails or letters or, or whatever they need to write effectively? Are they going to be able to read things such as prescriptions, news, things like that? These are all questions that you can answer or that you should be applying in these situations. And finally, I've just written up here, what level of support does, it, does your client need to function independently? So not only how does their ability affect, or how do their abilities affect their functioning, but how do, what level of support will they need to function independently? So thinking about you know, post-injury rehab to home care, um, thinking about the continuum across time. And these are all applications that speech and language and OT, occupational therapy, can apply the RAT5 to answer. So finally, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's answer this question. Um, why should I move, why should you move, from the RAT4 to the RAT5? This is always a legitimate question to, to ask yourself. When a new addition or a new revision comes out for a test, you should always sit back and think about why you're doing that. Um, and, and essentially, the answer that I'd like to give you for this question is, it does give you new norms. It allows you to access uh, a digital administration scoring and reporting. There's an improved ability to identify learning disabilities and then a really a streamlining of rules and subtest improvements. So hopefully all in this uh, 40, 42 minutes, you all got uh, enough information about the RAT5 to really make your decisions effectively. 
Uh, we are at the end of our uh, of my discussion today, but what I'll do is go through some of the questions if you want to stay around uh, for a couple of minutes, and I'll go through some of the questions and see um, if there are some I can answer at the current time. Uh, for those of you who are signing off, um, have a great day, and I hope you all come back. But I'm going to stay on for a couple of minutes and answer some additional questions. So I did have a question that came through about how long will the RAT4 still be viable to use? Uh, that's an interesting question, um, and it comes from Angela. Uh, that's a question that's difficult to answer because I don't know what setting you're in. Um, certain settings or certain professions have regulations or certain states have um, guidelines that they provide. Some say a year, some say less. Um, best practice is to switch as soon as you can. Um, it doesn't need to be immediately. Um, but best practice and psychological practice is that you, uh, you would switch um, as soon as, as feasibly possible. Um, again, really going back to the idea of the having a current norm group. Um, let me read some additionals. Um, Uh, so I did have a question that came through. Is it, allow, is it designed to allow administration of single subtests independently? Charles, yes it is. Uh, you can give one subtest or a bunch of them uh, if you wish. I did have some questions that came through about um, um, norms on specific populations. Um, I don't have that data in front of me. Um, so if you, uh, if you come back or uh, you know, we can come back with some of that information when we look at the norm sample that comes through, I don't have that data coming from me since it's not revealed or since it wasn't released yet. Um, I don't have the study, uh, the, the specific populations uh, who were included in the test. Um, I did have a question come through about Fran uh, from Francis about how much it will cost. Um, you can go to these two websites if you're in the U.S. or Canada. Um, and uh, the current pricing lists will be listed as that. Okay. Um, so when will the RAT5 be available for purchase? It is coming soon, so um, fall 2017. Let's see if I have any other questions. Um, did have a lot of questions come through from folks in the UK. Uh, welcome. Um, I don't have information about how that how certain items were adapted for the UK. Um, you can again, you can contact. Go to your um, the Pearson UK website um, and um, contact customer service there, and they should be able to provide that information for you. <clears throat> Did have a question came through about separating the irregular and regular words for norms. Uh, or on the test, the word reading test. There is no separation. Uh, the question came through from James. Uh, James, there is no separation for those two. Um, they're provided or they're, 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 um, they're, they're delineated or listed out based on um, difficulty level. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of sight words are, are mentioned early. Uh, at the easier items and more irregular words are listed later on. Uh, but there is no data that separates the two of those from each other in terms of test scores. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't analyze that yourself. So when you provide or when you get the the, uh, the the scores from the from the examinee, you're able to then go back and, and look at the items and which ones they got wrong and and, and which ones they got correct, uh, and make that analysis yourself. But because of the the difficulty progression of the items, um, there's no there was no way to separate those two out. Okay, I did have a question about the slides for a further review. Um, I sent out an email earlier today that was um, uh, it was an update. You should have gotten an update um, on uh, from this uh, from this presentation. And what it shows is a downloadable uh, file on the right hand side of the screen. It says downloadable files, and under there you'll find the handouts. So feel free to download that um, at your leisure. <clears throat> Okay. All right. Um, all right, everybody. So we're about at the end here. If I have some additional questions, I see there's a bunch of questions coming through that I might forward to uh, to our product management team to see if they can help you answer. Um, otherwise, I hope you all have a great afternoon.
uh, morning, wherever you're at, evening. Um, and I'll talk to you all again soon. Bye-bye.